welcome. Very nice to have you here. Thank you. And thank you, thank you everybody for um, the invitation and for coming to listen. I'm going to try and make the links. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity for trying to make the links um, between leadership, um, conservation, um, and just trying to deal with this difficult world we live in at the moment. So I am, by training, a natural scientist. Is anybody else here a natural scientist by training? Right, okay. <laughs> so the title is an, a connected um, approach to leadership, but perhaps more accurately, it's going to be how a, connective, um, a connected approach fosters leadership, and that's leadership in the plural. And you'll see what I mean, I hope, as, as the talk progresses. So much of what I'm going to be talking about is to do with how each of us, little individual beings, are confronted with these huge problems, these huge systems. How do we make sense of things and how do we decide what to do? So the organisation of the talk is roughly going to be starting from looking at ecology. As I said, I'm a natural scientist. What can we understand from ecology that might help us in solving these complex problems? Because ecology itself is all about relationships, it's all about complexity, and how do you try to understand that? And then I'm going to apply some of these kind of conclusions to a case study, which is my project, the Mali Elephant Project, that's been going since 2003 in the Goma region of Mali, and then try and look at some of the implications of these things for leadership more generally. So, as I said, I'm a natural scientist. When I was training, there were two kind of two books that were incredibly influential. I don't know if any of you have read either of them. But there is The Selfish Gene. You've probably all heard of that, Richard Dawkins. Very reductionist approach to evolution, basically saying that um, genes use organisms to perpetuate themselves. So it's about adapting very closely to the environment. And it's often been taken to be, to be seen as to totally focused on competition. So we have organisms competing with each other. And that almost like life and evolution is all about competition. Then at about just a few years later, you had James Lovelock's Gaia, which was com completely the different, different perspective. It was looking top down at the planet and trying to understand life from this very top down perspective. And not surprisingly, as always happens, there's a furious row between these, these two. And there still is, as to which is accurate and which is right. Actually, they both are, but in their particular domains, in their, partic from their, in their particular perspectives. But I'm going to focus now a bit on the um, top-down one, because it's less familiar to most people, and it's more challenging in a way. So Lovelock first got this idea when he was asked by NASA to help, to help them with their Mars mission. It was sending a probe out to Mars. How would they know if there was life? What tests could this robot do that would mean that they could detect life? So there were all the biologists were there who were kind of inventing little machines to scoop up bits of soil to test for bacteria and things like this. But Lovelock thought, but what if life on Mars is nothing like life on Earth? How do we detect it? And because he was a chemist, he thought he came from a different perspective. And he said, what is the one feature that all life forms have? And the one feature is that they take in chemicals, they do something with them to get energy for themselves, for their life, and then they excrete different kinds of chemicals. And he said, if we could see evidence of that kind of process, you would see it in the atmosphere, you'd see it in the earth, in the, in the soil, then you, would, then you could say there was life. And then he thought, that actually, he looked at the atmosphere of these planets, so Earth, Venus, Mars, our two nearest neighbours, you can, you can look from afar, you point a spectroscope at, uh, at the atmosphere and you can tell the chemical composition. I found that Venus was mostly carbon dioxide, Mars was mostly carbon dioxide, but Earth was completely different. It was a mix of oxygen, nitrogen and lots of other gases, highly reactive. These two atmospheres have been what we call at equilibrium. So when you put a bunch of chemicals together, you allow them to react until they react no more. They call that equilibrium. This is way out from equilibrium. It's a mix of reactive gases, and those two things, an explosive mix in some cases, and those two things can only, that can only happen if they're continually being produced and taken out of the system, continually being put back. So that led him to say, Venus and Mars, there's no life there. Earth 
is a living planet. That's life. You can just tell that by looking at the atmosphere. And then he looked over time and he found that that atmosphere had been pretty much stable between limits for long periods of time, hundreds of millions of years. And he was talking to his friend, Carl Sagan, some of you might have heard him, very renowned of him, around astronomer. And he said, well, there's an embarrassing problem for astrophysicists that we can't explain. If you take the age of the Earth right back from you know, over 4 billion years when it um, coalesced up to now, and you look at the average global temperature of the Earth, there's their zero. The sun has actually been increasing, so it's now third more um, powerful than it was when the Earth began, and you'd expect that the temperature of the Earth to be that. But actually, the temperature of the Earth is that. Well, it raises between these, these bounds. Is, that can't be understood just by astrophysics. So Lovelock started, he started thinking, well, maybe life had something to do with it. And he looked at other properties of the planet, and he found that things like salinity and um, acidity, and all these properties that are important for life, all had kept within the bounds required for cell by cell membranes. So the cell membranes that bound all life forms they require certain properties, and if you go too high or too low, they just fly apart. So all these key properties of the Earth had made within limits. And he just made an intuitive leap, and he thought, maybe there's something about life that has kept, that has somehow perpetuated uh, an environment on Earth that is conducive to life. So, his, so up, at, up until this point, the conventional view of planet or of life is that you have physics and chemistry that determine what the environment is life, like, and then living things adapt to that. But he thought maybe living things also affect their environment. So you get these actual feedbacks between the two. And that was his great intuition. And ever since then, he's been looking for ways to, um, and scientists who are who are interested in this, looking for ways to, to prove this and to, to find links. But it's very, very difficult with the scientific method we have. It's the scientific method we have, it's very linear. It's all about it's all about blocking out complexity so that you can identify the major factors. So the method actually mitigates against trying to understand complexity. So to give an example of what what um, how this might work. This is a little um, plankton, single cell plankton. It secretes these plates around it of calcium carbonate. And it lives in the, in the oceans. And it has the, the idea of um, life and the environment affecting each other is that when an organism is, it adapts itself to its environment, it has an impact on that environment which then has an impact on other organisms, has an impact on the planet, and then that could even feed back onto the original organism. So in this case, this organism, it, when the conditions are good, it blooms, it, it kind of reproduces really, really fast. This is just off Alaska, you can see this big bloom, and these can be hundreds of kilometers um, wide and long. And you can see they cause, this is off the coast, coast, of, coast of Devon and Cornwall, huge blooms. And this has an enormous impact on the reflectivity of the planet, which has a big impact on temperature of the planet. It also, they also have a big impact because when they die, they fall to the floor, and all the carbon <coughs> that is locked up in their bodies, and particularly in those little shells that they have, sinks down to the bottom of the so it's effectively taking co uh, carbon out of the atmosphere, burying it in the sediments. And then eventually, over like a big geolo geological time, some of that might be uplifted, as we have um, not far from here. These are, this is all the remains of the organisms that are actually being sunk to the bottom, compressed into rock. So that's, that's, a, that's an, um, an example of how that, those tiny little creatures you know, have an, actually can have an impact on climate. They also have an impact on another, on, on, in another way. And he was, th he was doing, when he was looking at this, he was looking at all the balances of the chemicals, the cycles of chemicals, and he was saying, there's too much sulfur in the ocean, so there's, how does it get back? There's too much on the land just to be caused by rock weathering. How does sulfur get onto the land? And he thought that maybe, he actually thought maybe some of these plankton again 
emitted a, a chemical which then got blown onto land. And indeed, when he searched the literature, he found that this little creature, again, is one of these organisms, secretes a chemical, dimethyl sulfide, which gets taken up into the atmosphere and a few chemical reactions, and it creates a nucleus for clouds to form. Clouds cool the planet, and so, and, uh, and then they go up here, and then the clouds blow over the land, rains down, sulfur gets returned to the land. But they also have this impact on climate, and it's a, a kind of a feedback loop, because when clouds come, the temperature decreases here, um, reduces the production of these, pl these phytoplankton, so there's less of them, fewer clouds, temperature warms up, <laughs> more, of these, yeah. more of these grow because of the higher temperature, uh, more di dimethyl sulfide, more clouds. So you see what, there's a, what you call the negative feedback. Now these things are incredibly, they're, they're impossible to model using our conventional scientific methods, conventional mathematics, absolutely impossible to model. None of the climate models can incorporate, incorporate this kind of thing. So the idea, so if we take um, the idea of the, the temperature of the planet, um, compare it to a human, as the and the outside temperature heats up, humans or organisms have many different mechanisms in their body that respond to, to rising temperature in different ways. So we've got core shivering, we've got surface shivering, we've got you know, the, the, the um, blood vessels dilate, and these all have an impact on the temperature of the body in, diff in, in different ways, so they, they're relating differently. But the sum altogether is that our body temperature remains constant even when the ambient temperature is rising. So that was his analogy, to try and help us understand how all these organisms doing all their different things end up with stable properties. And, I mean, this was really, at the time, in the 70s, regarded as absolutely ludicrous by most natural scientists. They said, how can, you know, you look at the planet, this huge planet, it's a lot of rock and um, the atmosphere, this tiny little film of life on it like the bloom on an apple. How can that ever have any impact on, on the planet? And, and, and Lovelock said, he compared it to a giant redwood. You know, look at a giant redwood. Most of its heartwood is dead. Its bark is dead. But there's a tiny little it's living tissue. It's just a very thin line there. You look at the planet, cross-section through the planet, it's similar. You've got these layers of rock, and you've got the protective atmosphere, and a tiny little kind of layer of life. His analogy. So the key message, first key message to kind of gather from all this is that actually we're living in this kind of incredible network of relationships and we're mostly unaware of them. We're unaware of the vast majority of them, taken completely for granted. And also the other thing is that these, this doesn't, you often hear analogies talking about the living world as a machine. Now, it really doesn't act like a machine. Machines are very predictable. We calculate, we can calculate what all the moving parts do and how much forces in different directions will, what result they will have. But these living systems, because of these feedbacks, they're very difficult to predict and they're not like a machine. We're, as I said, we're mostly unaware of that, much of it. And then a key factor is this notion of emergence. If you've got lots of individual agents, as they're called, interacting in these different ways, they're connected in different ways, they allow these feedback loops and somehow this, you, you get these, you know, this behaviour that emerges. It's kind of quite mysterious, but um, an example of an emergent behaviour in ourselves is conscious, is thought to be consciousness. We have all these, um, these things going on in our bodies and consciousness seems to have emerged. So this is a kind of bit of a dry slide, which I was wondering whether to delete or not. But it's just basically it's just showing here you've got these individual components and they're linked in different ways. And you know they'll be linked. Some will be linked to many other things, and some will be linked to not so many things. And as a result, you get these kind of emergent behaviours or these emergent properties. An emergent property being the temperature of the planet or the temperature of the Earth. And this emergent property is also feedback. And the, the, pro the properties of these um, living systems is that there's nobody, there's nothing really controlling the micro behaviour of all these components. What actually happens is emerging from bottom up, and it's a result of this connectivity. 
and that there's some of these um, they evolved to a state which is um, very adaptive to local conditions and it's what as we as I explained earlier it's far from equilibrium because you've got these processes things moving forward it's put it far from equilibrium it's um, it, it, it just means that there's um, the state is alive really things are going on and that these states that arise are very often very resilient to, to disturbance but, but they are also unpredictable so we just try to illustrate some of that that some you must have seen you know flocks of starlings or other birds wheeling around creating these patterns when, when they try to model this in a computer, you can actually create these patterns just by very few rules, like um, birds like to stay together, but they like to keep a certain distance apart, and each bird will follow its neighbour. And that will produce those kind of patterns. That's an example of emergence. Very simple rules, lots of individuals, but an emergent pattern arising. But basically, um, the first one, the wolves, is talking about how when uh, wolves were reintroduced back into Yellowstone after, I think, an absence of 70 years. And um, what very rapidly happened, just a few wolves were introduced, but very rapidly, um, the deer, uh, the, the deers, obviously when wolves had gone, the deer numbers had increased enormously and had a huge effect on the um, ecosystem. But when wolves came back, Suddenly, their behavior—they ate some deer, but their behavior changed. So they no longer the deer no longer spent so much time in the bottomlands around the stream edges. So that meant that the forests started coming back along the sides of, of the river. And when the forests started coming back, the birds started coming back. And so there was an enormous um, diversity. But also, what came back were the beavers. Because um, the forests were coming back, so the beavers had uh, materials to make their lodges. So, and then when the when the beavers started making their dams, they, the um, erosion was much reduced, and so the um, stream banks uh, were um, strengthened because not only did you have the forests, but you also had the dams, and so the actual courses of the river was changed so that. Um, water didn't kind of rush through quick, so quite so quickly. So you had, just by reintroducing a very few wolves, you had this kind of incre incredible, quite rapid flowering of diversity and um, ecosystems and uh, so many more ecosystem services produced. The whales, similarly, um, there's all kinds of, uh, in, in, the, in the film there's all kinds of statistics which, um, which uh, illustrate this, but whales, um, have been hunted because they've been thought to compete with fishermen. They said that, well, if you get rid of whales, there'll be more fish for us. In fact, the opposite has happened because what whales do is they feed at death and they, they eat, um, which is there, when they come up to the surface and when they kind of excrete all their waste products, that has an enormous fertilizing effect because the surface waters of the ocean are very nutrient poor. So as soon as these great plumes of nutrients get released to the surface waters, um, lots of, uh, lots of um, plankton are produced and they feed the fish, so actually it generates fisheries. And as I said, in that film they actually say the magnitude of their impact on fisheries is huge. But not only that, in their very process of going down from the bottom of the ocean to the top, they create mixing. In fact, they the number of whales before they were kind of slaughtered, their numbers were decimated, actually um, created more mixing than all the winds and waters of the whole planet put together. So they mixed it because those bottom waters are very nutrient rich, so they're bringing up nutrients to the surface. And of course, if you get more plankton, then you get more plankton. When they die, they sink to the bottom, they bury that carbon. So they have an impact on uh, a quite significant impact on climate. So just another illustration of how these things are connected in ways that we we have no idea. I'll just get that one. The other feature of these systems is that they're they're unpredictable. So for example, we take um, the fisheries of the very good fisheries of the the north coast of Namibia. Um, very highly fished and catches were beginning to decline. Then they suddenly unpredictably crashed. 
and what happened at the same time was an explosion of jellyfish. And that was because the predators of the jellyfish, too many predators were being taken away. So the jellyfish numbers could increase. But the jellyfish problem is they also eat the eggs of the fish. So very difficult to get back again, to get that system back again. If we'd been thinking in linear terms, we'd have extrapolated that decline. We might have thought, oh, we've got a lot more time before that fishery is exhausted. But actually, in these living, these complex systems, you get these sudden, what they call tipping points. You might have heard that term, that expression. As I said, these systems tend to be resilient, but um, the more diverse they are generally, the more res resilient they tend to be. And, you know, our kind of onslaughts on their diversity. As it increases, what this is trying to show, that as um, that diversity is reduced, in this case, it's an impact, combined impact of overfishing plus pollution runoff off the land. It takes a lot, it's a long time before you start seeing a change. It absorbs a lot of the impact. This is going through here. But each of these transitions happens faster and faster and faster. And that's what this is trying to show. So to shift from this state to this state, one of these to one of these, the first transition takes a lot of insult. So it kind of absorbs a lot of impact. But then the next one happens faster and faster and faster. <clears throat> and as with the jellyfish, this is often irreversible. This is an example of um, deforestation of cloud forests. Um, cloud forests are actually sustained by their own, they intercept clouds and so they kind of create their own moisture. Once that forest is taken away, it's doubtful there may not be enough moisture there for it to actually regrow, even if the pressure of deforestation was removed. And in fact, there's um, research now that tends to suggest, for example, the conventional bears view in the world is that our tropical rainforests, the Amazon, for example, is there because of the rain. Actually, now it seems to be that the actual the forest is creating the rain. So if the forest is taken away, you know, a drought, dry climate comes in its place. So this is a real challenge for us in the world. You know, we have linear minds. You know, all of our, our big challenges, climate change, biodiversity loss, desertification. This is just showing how the feed that the cycles all reinforce each other. We deal with things in silos. Actually, you know, they're all linked. So this, this kind of network, this connective perspective, if we look at the apply it to history of life, we can kind of get to see a few more four, a few more lessons. So if we just quickly do 4.2 billion years in about two minutes and look at just the real breakthroughs, the advances in evolution. So first life forms were bacteria. There's a, ba there's a group of bacteria. That's if you, if you dissect it, you see it's basically kind of a capsule with some DNA inside and a bit of machinery to allow it to do some molecular reactions. And so and what you find for the first two billion years of, of life on Earth was a proliferation of all these different types of bacteria. And it might seem very kind of pretty dull, but actually they were inventing all the metabolic processes we use today. So each bacterium can do one little chemical reaction. But what that means is that they tend to live in colonies. This is in, in groups, because one bacterium is kind of feeding off another one's waste. So this is a present day example of a bacterial mat. If you take a crop section through that, you'll see you've got different layers, and each, each layer of bacteria is adapted to different conditions. So these ones at the surface will be using oxygen to produce something to get their energy. These ones at the bottom will probably be using sulfur or methane or something, not oxygen. So they're all, they, they all kind of act together in these little um, colonies. Then there was a sudden evolutionary leap when these bacteria somehow came together to form a, a, a complex cell. A complex cell like this one. And one of the um, great breakthroughs recently, again very controversial when it was first um, proposed, is that each, this is a complex cell, it's a still a single cell, you know, something like this is a paramecium, but amoeba, that kind of thing. All these little things inside it were once 
bacteria, free living bacteria. And what's happened is over time, these learned how to live together and become one organism. This is, this is a slightly easier to see. What, and um, there's one woman who dedicated her life to actually looking at these cells and finding free living bacterial analogs still living today. So there's this idea of coming together and once, and, and there's all kinds of benefits that they get from that, increased protection, increased mobility, increased access to food, which is how that sort of negotiated um, <laughs> arrangement existed. And then we have the next, um, the next kind of evolutionary leap, where when these type of cells aggregated together to create multicellular organisms like us, and uh, all the kind of big organisms that we see in you know, trees, they're all created of many of these kind of cells who have somehow learned to live together to make another type of creature. So that's the kind of pattern of, the, they're the big evolutionary leaps in life. Often the evolution is, is presented very much as pure nature, red and tooth and claw, it's all about aggression and competition, but the big leaps come through cooperation and collaboration and what you could call negotiated self-interest. So this is a lady who has dedicated her life to a kind of elucidating this process. And she says, we are basically a product of thousands of millions of years of interaction among highly responsive microbes. We're kind of colonies of microbes. So the ne next key, key uh, message is, is that if you look through life, the history of life, evolutionary leaps come through a kind of a negotiated self-interest. Kind of a, what we might call cooperation. Different organisms coming together for mutual benefit. And this requires a whole, what we could call, conversation. They do it by chemicals, all these chemical um, uh, reactions that they, uh, they invented. And in fact, the fact that we share 70% of our DNA with nematode worms, little worms, is due to the fact that we're both built from these kind of bacterial um, building blocks, who invented all this stuff billions of years ago. So if we take that kind of that onwards, forwards, non-cellular um, organisms, you know, they're coming together and we, we kind of social living, which has been taken to, apart from the social insects, um, it's been taken to its uh, kind of pinnacle in mammals and we've developed emotions to help us negotiate those, that, that, social, that social living. And then onto humans who developed their, their neocortex, which has enabled them to develop that social living even more. It's to the point that we're totally reliant on society and we've become completely <coughs> hardwired to, um, to, for that society. We've developed, um, you know, the, uh, the bacteria and the rest of them, you know, the cells of our bodies communicate chemically. We've developed um, different, uh, additional kind of language, and I think we also use the chemical one as well. And it's meant we're very adaptable, and um, we have foresight and all these other things which, which you know. But it's a kind of a, it's again, it's just the same pattern and progressing on. But the key thing here is that we're highly social, and I think sometimes we don't actually quite realise how social we are. We look at all the terrible things in the world, but we're very, very dependent on social. And our emotions have been have been evolved, have evolved to reward many of the kind of activities that promote that social living. So, really, from this whole first part, what I'm trying to get across just these these two diagrams. You think of the economy, our economy has been around maybe order of magnitude 3,000 years, and our society maybe 1 million years. But nature, the planet out of which we've evolved, has been around for billions of years. And yet when we think about how we organize our systems, our society, we look at it the other way around. We think of the economy first, society within that, and then maybe nature somewhere, somewhere if we've got a bit of money. Um, so that's a perception shift I'm trying to, to try and uh, um, portray here. Why does it matter? Well, I think it matters because the way we understand a problem determines what actions we take. Um, often, I'm sure all of you have witnessed short-term solutions that 
solutions, so-called solutions, a short-term impact to try and do something about a complex problem which actually then creates more problems, worse problems down the line. And also the other reason is that this kind of connected perspective, it gives you many more options to, uh, to solve a particular problem. If you take a linear perspective, it's, it's often, you know, it looks impossible, but if you take this more complex perspective, there are often many more ways. And this is an example of how if your, perspective, your um, perspective determines what you do, and short-term solutions are often not good on the long term. This is an example of sudden oak death in, in California, in the trees and forests of California, having a huge economic impact on the orange and almond trees and um, many of their crops. Now, the forest scientist's response is to inject the trees with um, pesticides to try and kill this fungus. Um, but an ecology, another perspective, is to look at, well, try and understand the, those trees and that ecology of the system. Now, one ecologist who tried to do that, studying those trees, and he noticed that the afflicted trees, they had split bark. Their bark were very often split open. And when he looked into it more clearly, he, had, he, he realized that what was happening in these systems was they were being protected from fire. But these are systems with very degraded soils. Mediterranean soils, are most of them have been lost, so there are not a lot of nutrients available. And what was happening, because these forests are protected from fire, they were growing, 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 but they run out of nutrients. And particularly the, the kind of nutrients they need for their bark. Those are kind of leached away very quickly. And so the bark was splitting and allowing the pest in. So what he did was he painted the trees with this very nutrient-rich kind of solution just to see what happened, particularly the bark. And this is, I don't know if you can see this, but this was a difference in two years. One tree, he put this, these nutrients around it. It's completely filled out again. And this was another one. Um, originally, and that's four years later. So, and in fact, pesticides actually increased the problem because it made the whole system more acidic and it was the acidity that was causing the problem. So this is an example whereby if you just take a step back and try and understand the problem in its whole ecological context, you come up with a very different solution. Why does it matter? Another reason. This idea that we're hardwired to work in groups um, and, and, the, and the need for continual conversation and that it's, it's because of the network nature of society embedded in the planet, actually individuals can do much more than they think. There's often you hear people thinking, what can I do? I'm one tiny little person. But because of this network, if you're aware of these networks, there's a lot more you can do. You've probably heard of this idea of six degrees of separation. Yeah? Everybody is connected to everybody else on the planet by six degrees. And the reason for this is you've got some people who are very connected to loads and loads of people, and you just have to hit one of those, and you can you can make um, a, a big leap. But there's also another um, study. It was called Three Degrees of Influence, and this was done trying to see how how people in, impacted their social circle. And what they found is that they were, they were highly influenced by people who were three steps removed. So your friends, friend, friend. This was a study done on happiness, and they found the happiness of your friend's friend, friend, actually had quite a big influence on you. Because we're social animals, we kind of very much pick up on, um, we have abilities of empathy, and we very much pick up on um, the influence of our, our associates. And in fact, they did all this kind of fancy measuring, you can look up the study, and <laughs> they came up with this idea, your friend's friend's, your friend's friend, the happiness of your friend's friend has more impact on your own happiness than for like five thousand dollars in your pocket. <laughs> so there's a, basically let's say you can have a lot more influence than you think. Right, so that's the end of the, the, the kind of the, the, the ecology bit. Now we're going to go to um, Mali Elephant Project and how I how those two are linked. Okay, so here's some Mali elephants, maybe elephant to note. <laughs> um, and this is where I am, in, this is Mali. 
And these, these are the tracks of eight of the elephants as measured by radio collar. This Timbuktu is there, and you can just see the Niger River as it goes through the desert in the delta. Um, a great variety of habitats there, you can see. Um, and a great variety of people, many different ethnicities and clans. So the mystery was in 2003, I came in as a zoologist, was to try and understand how these elephants survived when all the others around them have disappeared. Um, they're an internationally important population. There's only two populations of desert elephants left in the world. And they take the, the longest and the most unusual um, migration of all elephants. So, my, so I was tasked with why are they still there and um, are they in danger of what needs to be done. So in 2003, at the time, there was this perception that the conflict was that the elephant number of elephants were increasing, and maybe they should be culled. And the people were saying, well, maybe we should rehabilitate a bit in the north so that all the elephants will stay there and they don't need to do this big migration and annoy people in the south. So that was what they were, and that's what people were talking about then. So eight elephants were fitted, that's an, that's an elephant collar, fitted with GPS collars. And there was a field team who went out on the ground to try and estimate their numbers. This is a close-up satellite image. There's the, the river Niger again, the delta here. For those of you who know Mali, this is the Bandigar escarpment with the, the Dogon um, people. And these are... Yeah, these are the tracks. Each colour is a different elephant, and they, they, they kind of do this migration. Some of them go up here, not all of them. That's, that's the kind of sense of it, what they do. And they're spending, what we know is they spend the dry season in the north, and they spend the wet season here. You can tell that from the dates on the, on the, on the colours. So what's happening? If we zoom in to, into the north, um, you can see there's these laterite plateaus and these dunes that come over the top. And here are water holes that collect at the foot of the dunes in the depressions, and there's a few lines of trees, and they're surrounded by forest. And if we look at the elephant tracks, you can see those are the really important areas for them. So although they're spread over this huge area, they're spending 95% of the time in these, in these areas where they've got water, they've got food, and they've got shelter from humans. That's what they look like from the ground. And so during the, during the dry season, they kind of they go from one water hole to another, and as one dries up, they go to another one, and they're moving around until every, all of them have dried up, except this one water hole, which is called Lake Banzana. At the end of the dry season, they're all there. And if we zoom in there, you can see again the dunes, the laterite plateaus. That's, in the wet season, that lake is this long. But at this time of year, it's, it's, that's all that's left. And you see again, the elephants are just really confined to those areas. Then, that's what it looks like from the air. That's what it looks like from the ground. Then, as soon as they smell that it's raining in the south, because the rain's coming out first, off they go. And they come down here. They come, so now they're in the south, into this, <coughs> this area. And the thing about the south is that it has no surface water. It has very good food, best food is there, but no surface water. So they can only be there in the rainy season. But the question is, why are they so concentrated? Why aren't they just spreading out over the whole of that area? If we just zoom in there, these are the kind of big sandstone butts. And we know, we know there's two features that surprise me. One is this kind of very clear line they're not spreading out. The other is, why aren't they coming through all these other passes? They used to in the 1970s, but they don't now. But when you look at the way the, where the villages are, you see this is the only one that doesn't have villages. The other thing we found out is that the chief of this village, very influential, very powerful, he's a pastoralist, and so he was able to prevent agriculturalists from coming and clearing the land in this area. So it was an area that elephants could use without causing them the trouble or conflict. So that's what it looks like from the air. And that's what that kind of area looks like, those sandstone butts look like from the ground. So it's quite diverse and green. And basically that's the story for the, the whole, I haven't got time to go through the whole, each of these, these places. 
but it's a combination of, this is a big sand dune, elephants hate sand, it's very difficult for them to walk over it, there's no water and no cover. And these other areas, they all have similar stories of, of the relationship between the humans and the elephants and how they've managed to survive. But one big blow for the elephants is Lake Gossi. Lake Gossi is here. And before the, uh, before the drought of the 80s, it was like Lake Benzanus. They would use it. There was nobody living, hardly anybody living there, a few tents, and they would use it like at the end of the dry season. Then, after, during the 80s, um, big droughts, people lost, um, there'd been big livestock build up up to the 80s, and then drought, a series of drought years, and people lost a lot of livestock. So there was, there was a very well-meaning development NGO who came in and wanted to help these people who'd lost their livestock. And so they thought, oh, how, they could, how, much, how many livestock has everybody? They, they totted up each individual, how many livestock. They calculated how much that was in money terms. It's a huge amount of money. How can we get that money back to them? Well, the only activity that's going to bring back good money like that is market gardening. So they tried to encourage, train, um, local people to, um, to do market gardening. They didn't want to, nobody wanted to do it because they said, we're herders, we don't, we're not gardeners, so we're not do we don't want to do it. So they said, well, okay, we'll pay you. And what that did was that brought in agriculturalists from <laughs> miles around who, want, who came to do the, um, the market gardening because they were getting compensation to do it. So very, very rapidly, the whole of the forest was cleared, the town grew up, on this side, and then gardens all the way around that side. So no longer elephants were able to to, um, to use that area anymore, and they, they put much greater pressure on other water sources, and potentially increased the conflict with the people already living there. So in 2006, after three years study, conclusion was that we had the, um, the elephant numbers weren't actually increasing but there was a perception that they were increasing because of increasing human impact all around the elephant range. You, need to, you had to look at that kind of elephant migration route as a whole. And that there were two key areas, those two I talked about, the dry season water in Lake Banzana, and what was called the Elephant's Gateway, where they go through that pass in the hills that needed action very quickly and probably within five years. But what do we do? This is an area the size of Switzerland, um, there were two foresters. Foresters are tasked with conservation in, in uh, Mali. They had no vehicles. Um, they, there was no government will, no interest, no morale, really. It was, you know, what do you do in a situation like this? Vast area. And so in my head, from, I just thought, well, may, what we want here is we want to turn this system around. The only, the only resource we really have is the people. So how can we, they're living throughout this area. And conservationists were saying, oh, we need to make a big protected area, we need to have rangers, we need to do that. But the resources required for that is enormous. What, and I was thinking, much better if the system is shifted so that it automatically produces the result that you want. So, with heart in mouth, we had we um, convened me meetings with community leaders, and I presented my results and I said to them, "What do you think? Do you think this is right? Do you think these are right? Have you got anything to add? Um, what do you think about elephants? And what are your? Do you have problems? And do you have solutions?" So you can see from these pictures, there were meetings, there were workshops, and the overwhelming um, sentiment was that. We don't want elephants to disappear, because if elephants disappear, it means the environment is no longer good for us. And when I heard that, my jaw dropped, and it was just the normal attitude. My jaw dropped because that is what the whole conservation enterprise in this country is trying to communicate, generally, that our lifestyles, everything we do, are dependent on um, a healthy environment, and that there's indicators that, that, that tell you how you're doing that. They understood that immediately, that elephants are an indicator of a healthy environment, and their livelihoods depend on a healthy environment. So that we have, we have, that's, we have real potential here. And they had ideas about you know, what, you know, what to do to, um, to mitigate and, or to, to conserve elephants. 
So we did an attitude survey just to, to test out and found that 78% thought it would be a bad idea for elephants if, the, if elephants disappeared. And when we looked more closely, we tried to look more closely at the reasons for that. Sort of the first reason they said, most people were talking about ecosystem services, um, wildlife, the importance of wildlife and biodiversity. That's represented by these green, uh, these green sections. Other people, many were saying, we're talking about the intrin intrinsic value, so elephants bring luck. Um, but they called it this, this term baraka, which um, people were translated to mean as luck. They are, and every species brings its own baraka to a system. If you lose a species, nothing else can replace it. And quite similar to ideas of biodiversity. And then talked about curiosity, rarity, intrinsic, it's a heritage, it's something that is special to us, our place. Only 1% talked about tourism, even though at this point they were receiving visitors from, from tourism. But if you talked in more detail, so this is the first thing here, you realise that actually all these, these are the, the negative um, attitudes, all these positive attitudes were sort of one aspect of a similar thing. It's a connection between the people, their environment, the elephants were a, signi were a significator of that, and it was all about their kind of their identity, and so they're very, and this feeling of connection. So, at this time I had very few resources, um, we really didn't have anything. The, my idea was to build, first of all, before we do anything, because actually, quite frankly, we didn't know what to do, and didn't have the money to do it, was to build a shared vision. And in fact, it was the, it turned out to be the best thing we did because it facilitated everything else after that. So identified our key, this is threats, problems for the elephants. Identified all the stakeholders who sort of impacted on them. So you've got the government, and the projects, you've got local communities, you've got tourists and visitors. And then tried, what we wanted was for people to take elephants into account when they do their, make their day-to-day -day decisions. These people include them in the plans and strategies. So, a government structure plan, uh, aid agencies plans. Get the tourists stop doing their bad their bad um, activities, and for the local communities to know how to live and live with elephants. So, we created a whole load of. Um, after having these meetings with the stakeholders, we created outreach materials based on these meetings. This is environment. This is schools, education project, um, local people, tourism to try and generate this shared vision. Then in 2009, a really bad thing happened. Lake Banzana, that dry season lake, was absolutely besieged by huge numbers of cattle and was drunk dry before the end of the dry season. So this meant this is very urgent. We needed to start doing something right now. But what to do? Didn't know what to do. So to try and understand a bit more about the situation, we did a household survey, all households, just to try and understand their perspectives, what their economies were, um, to get a little bit more information. And we were really surprised. I had, I had assumed, we'd all assumed that increasing settlement around the lake was, a, was linked to this increasing numbers of cattle, and that was the problem. But actually, what we found out was over 96% of those cattle using the lake didn't belong to the local people at all but they belonged to the wealthy, urban, Malians, Nigerians, Burkina, Burkina Bay. So these are the, the wealthy middle classes, the politicians, the businessmen, who culturally, when they had surplus money, they'd buy more cattle. So these, and because they were getting, they were relatively very wealthy, getting very wealthy on the international global markets, cattle numbers were just absolutely ballooning. And these prestige herds of cattle, because there's no pasture left around the towns, they're sent out into the more remote places to find pasture. And that this was an enormous problem. That was a surprise, we hadn't expected that. There was also high levels of resource degradation coming largely from the towns, the urban centres, but also people displaced from elsewhere, just trying their hand at cultivating so they clear a bit of sandy ground maybe get a little bit of a harvest for one or two years and then nothing, and then abandoned and the soil blows away. Another surprise was that over 50% of the people suffer from waterborne disease. We didn't know things were that bad, but when you think you've got all the cattle, you've got all the elephants and the people, that's the water they're drinking, 
um, it's been not surprising. So with these findings, we brought all the clans, there were 11 clans and um, other ethnicities, brought them together to present the results of our studies and to promote discussion about their problems. What are, so we all start with their challenges, what are they having difficulties with, um, and then in talking about these findings, what did they think about it. So the idea was just to discuss until they had a unified perspective. So a way of creating unity. So providing facts um, and yeah, this shared perspective of the problem. Because once you have a shared perspective, you could then say, now what, what has to be done about it? And what they decided was that um, it would be much better if people didn't live near Ben Banzana. They would like some clean water somewhere away from the elephants with some with much with good pasture because there's very bad pasture around Banzana. So we raised money to sink. I wouldn't normally sink boreholes, but in this case, um, it sank boreholes outside the elephant range in an area of good pasture, and they moved. And a few months later, the women were very happy. They said we no longer suffer from disease. The men can go back if they want, but we're, we're going to stay here. But there's another problem that, which kind of applies to the, the whole of um, this area. That these different ethnicities, they all have their own systems of resource management, but they don't obey each other's. And so effectively what we get is a tragedy of the commons. People just using resources um, because if they don't, then that person from another ethnicity is going to so what we, uh, when with, with the community we were working with that had moved to this relocation area, we actually worked with them to find to devise systems, they devised the systems that included everybody, that ev all ethnicities present there would obey. So they set up a management committee of elders who determined the rules of resource management, and then they, they chose particularly young men who went on patrols to make sure that, to basically police the roles, make sure that people were um, obeying these rules of resource management. So the idea is that wise resource management, more resources become available, they set areas aside for elephants, but, and the elephant migration route, but they, they like to do that because that means that they can prevent others coming and clearing those, um, those areas. Um, so the first thing the management committee did was to set aside an area of reserve pasture, almost uh, 100,000 hectares, which has left the end of, the, of the, um, the dry season. They asked us to help them protect it with fire breaks. So here they are, the young men dragging thorn bush to create the guideline, and then other teams of uh, clearing the vegetation. And that year, luckily for us, in a way, a fire ripped through that whole of the northern part of the elephant range, and their, their reserve was the only bit that didn't burn. So they were the communities that had pasture at the end of the dry season. They didn't have to bring it in. So when other communities saw that, they all said, please, we want help to do the same thing. Subsequently, we've done a little kind of um, evaluation of, of how much benefit this pasture has brought. Um, there's several benefits. They're able to sell hay to others. They're able to sell grazing access rights. Their livestock are, are worth 50% more at market. They're healthier, give more milk, produce more young. And there's one community that we've been able to monitor through all the conflict and everything. This makes about $24,000 a year, which is quite a significant amount in that, in that area from these things. So, providing them with benefits, that helping them to solve their problems. And it's possible because Mali has this decentralization legislation which puts natural resources under the control of local communities. So they can make these conventions, they can make these, um, these agreements, and it's protected by law. There are other, other laws that we've, we've, we've kind of trawled the legislation to try and find other laws that um, support, for example, the life, the pastoral, the, the livestock legislation supports the creation of, of pasture reserves, etc. So everything was working really, really well, really well, until um, 2011, when the, the fall of Gaddafi, and Tuareg mercenaries returned back heavily, heavily armed to Mali. Um, and there was a coup in 2012, and virtually overnight the government fled, and the area was completely overrun 
by armed groups, young men, very heavily armed. We had Tuareg, Tuareg separatist groups and we had jihadist groups who had been um, kind of lurking in the north of Mali. They'd, they'd been refugees from the Algerian civil war, civil war hadn't, hadn't signed the peace accord in Algeria and they'd sort of um, hopped over the border into Mali and been um, staying there taking hostages every so often. But with this sudden power vacuum, they came south of this alliance, and, and just the area was overrun, um, lawless, full of young men with arms. And sure enough, we had our first elephant poaching incident. We hadn't had any poaching before then. And I thought, oh, what do I do? Because in Cameroon, just, um, just shortly beforehand, they'd lost hundreds of elephants in just a very few weeks. Um, and I thought, oh, is this what's going to happen in Mali? Because if it does, you know, these elephants are going to be wiped out. But what can we do? So we had a meeting, a four-day meeting with the communities, allowing, and it was partly to allow them to um, talk about what they were experiencing because, you know, they, these things were happening and they didn't, you know, they could make no sense of a lot of them and they didn't know what was happening. So this gave them an opportunity to exchange about what was happening to them, talk about their preoccupations and for us to raise the issue of elephants. Their biggest problem, one of the biggest problems, was that they couldn't get grain because every vehicle was being hijacked, all the supply lines. So we helped them bring grain in and distribute it by donkey cart, so helping them to get grain. Their leaders said that they would establish a social sanction that if anybody kills elephants, they are regarded as a thief, something very shameful, and they communicated that even to the, to the leaders of the armed groups as well. They're establishing a sort of a social, social uh, war. And their other concern was that their young, their young men joining armed groups. They, they really were concerned about that. Um, and so we recruited uh, 520, what we call, it eco, I guess, eco-guardians to watch over the elephants. So they're sort of enforcing the elder. The elders said this is forbidden, but for it to work, they need, there needs to be a risk that they're going to be detected. So this is what the, these young uh, eco gardens and when when there was a poaching incident, they would they were able to find out who did it, because everybody knows everything that's, that's happening there. Um, the jihadists at this time were paying between thirty and fifty dollars a day for recruits, and although we only paid in the equivalent of food, it's a kind of a recognition payment. It wasn't any kind of salary. Not one of these young men joined the jihadist groups because they said that this work gave them more status within their community, it was safer, it was a more noble occupation, more valued. So this is one of them looking out for elephants. So, and in 2013 the French airstrikes came in, so back the jihadists, but government never really returned. We had ongoing insecurity, bandits, traffickers and poachers, and an absent government, and those two sort of fed each other, and it and it's still like that. At the same time, the conflict had increased the division between communities, um, so setting things back and compromised local livelihoods. So you've got all these things, all sort of mutually, you know, a really bad evolution of the system, kind of mutually reinforcing each other, and the poor elephants and people stuck in the middle of all this. Oh, what can we do? Well, the young community eco guard said, you know, we need some help because these, you know, these people are armed. We need some kind of armed backup. We certainly didn't want to arm them. So we had to somehow galvanize <laughs> some action from the government um, and find a way to do that. A government that is quite frankly totally self-interested and, um, you know, not able to act. The great thing we had with the communities is that they had the information. So they're the sort of ears and eyes on the ground. So what, was, what they needed was someone to come in to be able to act. So our first attempt was um, 50, 50 rangers created by the government. Um, but soon after they were created, there was a change right at the top to somebody who was highly corrupt and highly um, 
of bad news in every way you could think of. And this, this kind of process just came to a halt. And, and, and you know, it's interesting, it's a very good example of how the top man just kind of changes the culture all the way down. So that you then got people locally who are also just um, trying to steal as much money for themselves as they can, trying to stop everything. You know, it's so it took two, more than two years to try and get this <laughs> to try and get this moving. But ultimately, through that time, um, our trainers who were supposed to be training them, they did two months of training and. Uh, I, I really admired them for persevering because they were getting no support, getting getting absolutely nowhere. And in the end, only five really kind of made the grade. But in that process, evidence was gathered which showed the incompetence of this, you know, this top person and he was eventually removed. And um, eventually removed. But in the meantime, while we were kind of wrestling you know, elephants were being targeted horribly. From 2015 onwards, you know, the, there was absolutely really aggressive targeting by traffickers, and we were losing a lot very rapidly. So we had to do some kind of interim solution. And so the, the, the local army bases were willing to help just to do the odd patrol. I mean, it was not what you want, it's not ideally from rangers, but they were at least showing some kind of government presence if we paid them to do that. So they helped us. In the meantime, and then, and that what that resulted in was what we were doing coming to the attention of the head of the armed forces. So the first first attempt at creating an anti-poaching force didn't work. We ended up with five rangers. Meanwhile, the, the security is getting worse. The jihadist insurgency is getting worse again. Um, but then the head of the army came in and gave thirty of his best soldiers, his very best ones, to this. So the anti poaching unit reconstituted again. And the reason he did that was because he'd seen how the how the army, the local army, had been able to work with information from local people to actually make a difference to this apparently very difficult area. So the first thing was so the trainers, very brave trainers, came back again. They trained this, after one month they said, this is the best unit I've, I've, we've ever, ever trained. So suddenly we went from incredible <laughs> impossibility and uselessness to the very best there is on the continent. So we've, we have them out there. And first thing we did was to take them to see the elephants, we hadn't seen them before. And then, they, and as I was saying, they were trained. And they were trained in these techniques of how to operate undercover, use tracking, and we also they also worked very carefully worked with the people. We trained them how to how to interact with local people to get intelligence. This is a local imam giving a blessing because they're so pleased to see some kind of show of government and order. And there's a medic among them, so whenever they come into a village, they treat um, they give medical treatment. And these a lot of these communities now have. Um, they haven't seen, some of them haven't seen government for five years. So they became fully operational in 2017, and despite the fact that this is the, at the moment, the UN's most deadliest peacekeeping mission, these have attack, attacked just in the Elephant Ranch over, over time, they've been fully operational on the ground since February, and there have been no elephants poached since then. And they are the only military that have gone into some of these areas. The foreign militaries, the UN, the Mali military, they just do not go there. They're jihadist controlled. So this is a, a kind of a, an incredible step forward. But at the same time, we're still working with local communities, building as, as much as we can, particularly in the ones that have suffered most social division as a, as a, as a result of all this. Because the thing about these, these resource management systems is that people have to come together for mutual benefit. They've got to work together. As one of those eco guards said, when you spend all day working together um, on building fire breaks and you're sitting around a fire at night talking, you realise you've all got the same problems. So, in this kind of situation, it's very tempting people to feel very isolated on their own. They think everybody's out for themselves. But by, by working with the communities and having some kind of active, tangible focus, 
um, it's, it's a means to kind of create that solidarity and to promote the re reconciliation, and they benefit from it. This is just an example, another example in, 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 on top of those kind of resource management systems of developing ways, I and mean, particularly working with the women is kind of very helpful because the men at the moment are very um, occupied with uh, <laughs> um, well, I suppose trying to trying to manage the, the security situation, but the women um, trying to devise um, income generating activities so that they actually get some income based on wise resource management. This is an example of generating vetiver, which is a very useful plant for them, but has almost disappeared through over harvesting. And um, and these are the, the young men. So it's, it's another kind of set of activities that's about that's based on wise resource management. So the better you manage your resources, the better you you, um, you bring that back. You um, benefit from doing these kind of things. And and when we do this, we go into the to the communities and, and the women who are involved, and we ask them what they want to do. So it's not always easy to predict because. It's, got to, it's much better if it's something they, they sort of know how to do, rather than trying to come in and, and train and, you know, a new kind of activity. Better to, for it to be something they know and they feel happy with, and better finding better ways to do it. So it's basically a two-pronged two approach, trying to, by um, you know, the, the, the government enforcement aspect, the legislation, we're trying to do something impacting on that and then actually working with the, the communities on the ground so that these two things sort of mutually reinforce each other. So now implications for leadership. I've been seeing all kinds of stuff here so I can see you've, you probably know all this already <laughs> but just a few, um, few points really, a quick recap. Um, basically the, the network is the basic pattern or organisation of living systems, and that something like sustainability, which is what we're, we're kind of aiming for, is not an individual property, but it's the property of a, a web of relationships, and that's the key thing, the focus on relationships, and that the basic principles of ecology can, can kind of understand, and um, certainly to my mind anyway, they can kind of help inform ways of dealing with these, ways of visioning, and then dealing with, the, with complex systems. Um, and then there's like this concept of systems leadership. Um, Peter Senge, I don't know if it's Senge or Senge, and Al, he wrote a paper on this. And basically he's saying instead of trying to come up with the plans, I mean, so you natural scientists, conservationists, they love this approach of, right, we, we send some experts in, we make an analysis of the problem, and they, they, they devise um, a plan that then has to be implemented. Instead of trying to drive a particular agenda, you're trying to generate um, what's there, to the people who are there to take collective leadership. So it's about trying to create the right environment so that you can bring diversity together and try to generate this kind of collective wisdom from, what, from that diversity you have. So you're trying to encourage the emergence of these solutions. And it, it, by doing that, they be creative, as we found, but they'll also be very adaptive because you're dealing with people, the elements who are actually on the ground. They will be, their solutions they come up with will be adapted to the situation that they're dealing with. Instead of trying to bring in something that you may have dreamed up from miles away, it's something that's actually adapted. And that's very much like organisms who adapt to their, they adapt closely what they do to their local environment. And a collective wisdom. It's about trying to empower others to be leaders in doing that. Because if you're trying to turn the system around, one person's never going to do that. It's got to be all those elements that are part of that system that have got to be mobilized to turn it around. So these are core capacities that various people writing on this kind of stuff have um, identified. Very much have to be ready to cross disciplines and try to understand um, the larger system. So I started off as a zoologist, but very rapidly, if you're working in conservation, you've got to understand economics, politics, sociology, um, all these different uh, these, these different disciplines. 
again, it's engaging all key, key stakeholders. So whenever we have our community meetings, everybody who's active in that area is invited to take part. And it's the skill of my field manager, who's an extremely skilled facilitator, who's able to bring those people together and create the space that everybody is able to contribute, should they wish. So by this, this kind of notion of discussion, it's creating this shared understanding using uh, social technologies. And a big part of what we do is to embed the concerns we want to talk about in people's everyday concerns. So there's benefit in, in it from them. That's something you learn from the selfish gene, that um, if you want somebody to do something, it's got to be in their benefit. That is normal. Um, so you're embedding the issue in everyday concerns empowering people so when they're talking about it um, and they come up with solutions you help them implement those solutions so when it came to the fire breaks for example we would convene fire break meetings we'd help them identify people who make fire breaks right and we'd say what are you going to contribute we're not just you know what is needed here what are you going to contribute well how can we help you so it's an interactive thing um, where training is required, we'll provide training. So, for example, these communities very often bookkeeping and record keeping um, are important skills that really help them manage these things. Um, in, another key thing is identifying your key assets. Again, conservationists love to identify what needs to be done and bring it in. But, for example, in where we were, a huge asset was this eco literacy of the local people. They really understood that elephants were an indicator. Another huge asset was that these kind of social technologies are quite uh, uh, are kind of familiar to them. You know, that's how it's part of um, their, 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 uh, the way they conduct their, their, uh, their business. And then you've got key individuals. You know, everywhere you've got a similar kind of mix of people. And so you find your people who are almost like key resources. And, of people who are doing things that are somehow supportive to your cause and if you have this wider systems view you can see how many different kinds of people can be integrated to support that shift in the system and then if you can link them up so that they benefit and that um, they're in their, their, uh, in their, their activities kind of mutually support each other um, then that things just Kind of leap forward. So, for example, for us, um, identifying particular trainers, identifying um, local people who were particularly engaged, um, local organisations that were particularly engaged, finding ways that they could come in and support what this was doing. It, it all kind of builds to help to making those links, making those relationships to shift the system. So, for the, the leader, you like, you know, their role is to sort of hold the vision, you know, keep the purpose, you know, clarify the purpose when all this conversation is going, and you know, kind of keep the vision of the strategy. So keep the vision, the end point, but be very flexible about how you get there. That's the point. Um, and then, of course, it's this balance between, you know, you're balancing between the you know, where you want to go and how you get there, but also the need for plans and the need to allow things to evolve. That's a fine balance of that. As it's the balance between you know, giving direction and giving support, depending on the context, depending on the person. The Centre now also came up with five con conditions for collective impact. That there has to be a common agenda, shared measurement systems, mutually reinforcing activities, as we've discussed, continuous communication. And um, kind of organisations that actually support these things coming coming to be. And then these these two talked about the personal challenges that that are involved really. That ultimately what also what guides as well as a kind of a perception of a, you know a systemic perception is also a kind of commitment. You know, there is so much difficulty and rubbish to kind of deal with, but that commitment is actually core because it, it, it kind of it takes takes people through. Ignorance is really useful, is to 
you go into something, you don't know all the answers, and that's particularly helpful when you're because you're crossing disciplines. So you're not going to know everything. There's a lot you don't know, and just being able to ask questions to, you know, helps you in your your in your ability to see the system. But it also allows others to be open and ask questions too. Patience clearly, tenacity clearly, um, seeing others' perspectives, um, particularly. I mean. An enforced solution, as I said, is completely impossible in this situation. We just couldn't do it, um, and, that, and that's increasingly so. As there's, you know, the more and more we have, more and more people um, vying for uh, place, recognition, resources. You know, enforced solutions are becoming more and more difficult. Handling conflict, of course, seeing opportunities and risks, and, and very much self-reflection as well, because always having to kind of check. Where am I in the system? Where are my attitudes? How um, how how do, how do I how am I how are, are my attitudes and thoughts and feelings impacting what's happening? So, uh, as ever, Lao Tzu, two and a half thousand years ago, he sort of um, got all there. He <laughs> got there first. He's saying. A leader is best when people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's embodying this idea that what you're trying to do when you're trying to turn the system around is that you're trying to get all those elements to, to take leadership, to engage them in turning that system around from a worse place to a better place. So thank you very much for listening.